Thanks, Matt. Um, and I'd just like to say a big thank you to Matt Stevens and also to Graham Skinner, whose work's been absolutely seminal for what I'm doing at Rouse Hill House, to Scott Hill, Mill Flight, and all the curator, curatorial team and others up at Rouse Hill who've been plying me with material. Um, I'd also like to acknowledge the elders of the Gadigal people for their strength and resilience in this land and acknowledge any Indigenous visitors who may be here today as well. Sound. Silence, place, music. I've always experienced the world through listening, first of all. I think this is because I'm a musician. I know this is not the sense that most people initially use to interpret the world about them. These days, it's more statistically likely to be a visual interpretation of the world. As a storyteller, I want to know how other people tell about this place. I want to hear it. My first question to myself when visiting somewhere new is, how does this place sound? How do I make sense of it by listening to it? How do I make sense of how it tells its story in sound for other people who may prefer not to listen first? What are the experiences museum or heritage site visitors search for when they visit our places of memory? To see, primarily I guess, to hear, to touch if they are allowed to, and perhaps most of all, to do. This is part of my larger question with music and place, how to get people to experience through doing, which Sydney Living Museums already does brilliantly with other areas of tangible and intangible visual heritage. Looking at Rouse Hill's music collection is dealing with the intangible object of sound and music, so ephemeral in the 18th and 19th century until the invention of recording, and so ubiquitous in the 20th and 21st through recording, broadcast and niche cast, often annoyingly so as the background wallpaper to all our lives. This is the question that all our speakers today so far have dealt with, how to put back the sound into a place, as it might have been heard by the generations who've lived there. This, of course, adds the additional dimension already mentioned of exactly which period of music you put back into the house and what sort of historic performance practice interpretation you give it. But Rouse's conserved layers of tangible heritage offer a fantastic framework for this if we look at it from our historically informed performance perspective. I've been researching Rouse Hill Estates music collection for just a year and you'll see circling around this is Rouse Hill um, this is an image from, I think, about the 1850s here, the house on the hill and the view from the house and then more contemporary images of it. And you can see two of the rooms inside, the layers of conservation going on. There's a, a 50s, 50s television. This is Kathleen and Nina Rouse here as little girls in the 1880s. But just to give you some idea of the, the look of Rouse Hill, although importantly not the sound. Um, so. Being with it for a year, I know I've only just scratched the surface. This presentation's scope is just some initial ideas about work in progress, which bring up some fascinating questions. More questions than answers at this point, but questions which I hope will have answers as I search further through the piles of music in Rouse's cupboards, drawers, dresses and piano stalls, and get to know the musical personalities of the Rouse people. To date, I'm speaking about a sample of music folios from what I believe is the Rouse middle period of music, the second, third and fourth generations of Rouses, Edwin and Hannah Rouse being the second generation, then their son Edwin Stephen Rouse, who was born 1849 and died in 1931, and his wife Bessie Buchanan, who was born in 1843 and died in 1924. They were married in 1874, and their daughter Nina was born in 1875, and she lived until 1968, and Kathleen, who was born in 1878 and suffered an unfortunately early death by accident in 1932. So I'm approaching the Rouse collection as a performer scholar from two worlds, historically informed performance practice and creation of new Australian music and artwork for platforms other than the main stage concert hall, and also from the perspective of a keen, extremely Australian public historian who's somewhat bemused by the abstraction of historically informed performance 
of music and new music into the concert hall um, in an Australian society in the 21st century where there's a real <coughs> decline in concert going audiences into those main stage halls, which is in total contrast to the heritage body approach of t with tangible heritage of placing it in context to fully understand the object. From my perspective as a former member of the historically informed performance chamber group Ironwood, we dealt with 19, late 19th century performance practice. Why, for instance, do we talk about Brahms' chamber music and research his performance practice through the correspondence and the manuscripts of Brahms, Clara Schumann, uh, violinist Ferdinand David and Josef Joachim, but actually rarely perform Brahms in the household drawing room um, as they themselves ran the rehearsals and some of the performances? Why does current historical performance concert presentation as well as school-based musicology, demand abstraction of the music and the listening experience into a large modern concert hall rather than the placement into the social context from which it originated. Surely this might be part of the answer to the dilemma of modern concert day audience re-engagement and the other half of the puzzle for demystifying and resituating what we term Western art music today for new audiences. So getting to Rouse Hill itself, its music collection contains about two and a half thousand items, which are absolutely huge and fantastic. Mostly sheet music, but also um, an existing upright piano, which you'll see in the drawing room cycling through here. Piano roll player, which rolls up to the piano. This is not the original piano. Um, there was an Erard, which was bought for the house in the mid 1850s. Um, and other, there's also other electrical music reproducing items like um, a 78 record player and some early to mid 20th century radios. Like the rest of the site, the music collection is multi-generation and in sight, much like your average Australian family's collection of household items anywhere. Um, unlike other families' collections, it's all still there though. Whether it's been moved around within the collection by subsequent generations is one of my questions. Patrick Buckridge, in his article about Woolmer's Estate Library, uses the terms endogenous, having an internal cause or origin, and exogenous, having an external cause or origin. So this has really influenced and become the frame for me looking at um, the music collection. Scott Hill, who is the curator of um, Rouse, mentioned yesterday that it is important to remember that because the Rouse family had several different properties and nearly everything from those other properties came to Rouse by the end of it, we've got this inside endogenous collection curation going on by the different generations, but also this incredible exogenous collecting going on with everything coming to the, the Rouse collection. So it's this amazing collection from inside and outside. Um, the original conservation policy set up in the late 1980s by James Broadbent um, was also to conserve and preserve the layers rather than to restore to any one particular period. This of course has changed now. Melon Scott I'm sure will be very happy to talk to anybody who's interested about that. Um, so it does reflect the, the multiple generations of the Rouse family Terry occupation. The other thing that I think is important to remember as Graham's talked about already this morning that um, heritage site music or places are not just objects. Music's also preserved orally and orally. Um, I worked with Indigenous colleagues on a play, Namit Jira, thanks very much to Genevieve Lacey as well, um, nationally and was welcomed to country by the various Indigenous custodians of these places. I realised that as a musician, I, we, have huge responsibilities, though not the insider ownership, to enable these musical stories of place as well. Western Aranda country around Andaria or Hermansburg, where the Namatjira story comes from, is hugely rich in song, in story, in art, weaving through everyday life. I think all countries or places in Australia are this rich in music and story if we know how to listen. I think projects to strengthen language through song and music are important in changing this particular silence. Regina Cantilla from Narukurawala, which is the Tiwi Strong Women's Choir, says, the songs are about people. We hear songs. We put the story into songs. Events, celebrations, funerals, so that singing and dancing about everything is how we maintain our culture. We don't write things down like you mob. Our songs are our history books. So this is a particular 
um, I suppose, issue at the moment. Uh, Rouse is a Darug place as well. Um, heritage is a living heritage as well. So I guess this um, becomes all of our old and our new combined in one place as well. Um, perhaps not for me to comment further on, but for somebody from Darug descent to comment on. Patrick Buckridge's 2006 article in the Library Quarterly on Warmer Estate Family Library, this is near Longford in Northern Tasmania, um, provides this framing for how I'm looking at the music collection. Warmers is roughly contemporary with Rouse, um, built in 1813, inhabited by six generations of the Archer family there and has also preserved its library in situ on the estate. Buckridge says about it, the family, family library constitutes a real and distinct social deployment of books and as such it should be of interest to historians of reading even when, as in the case to be discussed, the collection itself is not especially large, valuable or unusual. The Rouse Music Collection provides an extraordinary opportunity to gain insight into one Sydney family's social music and perhaps their musical community life and to start to re-establish some broader patterns for social music making in New South Wales in the 19th century and perhaps particularly in Western Sydney. Um, largely it is the pattern of the popularity of the music in the collection that tells us more about what, have, what may have been going on in Sydney in the the later 19th century, I guess. Like the Warmers estate book, it has a mix of what we'd term high culture and low culture today. The Warmers books and the Rouse music have the same high pattern of usage when compared to similar libraries in Britain. So this appears to be a big contrast between Britain and its colonies in terms of the usage of books and music as display status symbols. And is this to do with the cost and availability in both places? On the surface, the Rouse Estate is colonial New South Wales version of the Grand Country House, perhaps built with the initial intention of being the imposing big house in the English sense of the word, with the church and the village at a little distance from the house. In practicality, however, the house, like the music collection, seems to be a much loved and used and very practical family home of hard working farmers and investors who built and lost their fortune over several generations on different properties around Sydney and including Gunterwang, which was near Mudgee. Um, in terms of the music collection signifying social status or not, Buckridge says of the Archer book collection at Warmers um, in the 1850s, Archer, we might surmise, was the sort of man who, for all his public prominence and familial authority, bought his books with no more than half an eye to signifying his social position, and read them deeply and thoughtfully, if also dutifully and methodically. Indeed, the pride of place, according to his penny cyclopedias and magazines, might be taken to suggest that knowledge, even in digested and extracted form, was far more important to him than the display of fine books for their social cachet. Um, so at the moment, the, Ra the Rouse music that I've looked at is very largely popular British and occasionally some New South Wales published music for piano and voice, piano solo, or occasionally piano and four hands. There's very little of the canon, the Austro-German canon of the 19th century there. The composers that I've seen feature so far are John Blockley, Brindley Richards, George Lindley, Balf, Charles Glover, a tiny little bit of um, Offenbach and Donizetti starts to creep in in the 1860s, as well as the Bertini piano studies, a couple of British vocal tu tutors and of course including co the Corrie vocal tutor. There's a lot of sheet music that follows the commercial star touring at that time. Um, but it's not, with the exception of the governess, Geraldine Anderson, who taught Nina and Kathleen as small girls, it's not a high art collection of music as far as I've seen. Um, it also poses one of my largest questions so far. Um, having been to the Sound Heritage Conferences in, in Britain last year, the physical state of the music in Australia, and um, Brianna commented on this as well, looking at the Simons collection, there's a lack of bound volumes of music. And in the case of the bound volumes um, that I have found, 
Um, the music within these bound volumes is really well used and the edge and the spine bindings are really quite worn from opening them and using them after they've been bound and page turning. And the sheet music is amazingly beautifully hand stitched and repaired with grow grain ribbons. So, and even that's sometimes falling off as well. So it seems to be a well used over several generations, really popular collection of music to play and sing at home. Um, so we've heard about Buckridge using the practice of music and book collecting to look at, um, at status in terms of the society. Um, personal collections of sheet music in, in Britain, usually around 30 pieces or songs, were bound together when the owner seems to have finished using them and bound for display on the shelves of the library or the music room or the drawing room. Um, women particularly had their personal collections bound at marriage to take with them as display items into their new home. Um, I think I've seen about two rooms worth of music at Rouse. Um, so I'm looking at this as just a representative sample. I could have all these theories exploded as I look at the others. Um, there is much more common loose folios of music that I've looked at at the moment. Um, so these are good quality leather or bound card and cloth with a strap and a buckle or cord ties to keep the sheet music often, you know, up to 30 items within. And they're all very worn. So it's all really high use music. Um, I'm going to talk about two very briefly. Um, R84218, 1 to 30. These, these have been lovingly done by the um, volunteers at Rouse. I hope, correct me if I'm wrong here. Um, and were done in 2003, I think, is that right? As early as that. Um, so they're done by catalogue by Rue at the moment rather than by generation or by title or publisher. Um, this, this portfolio has some advertising in its back cover and we got it from the schoolroom, which is one of the pictures that comes up, the one with the television in it, and the cabinet that we got it from is just on the far right-hand corner here. Um, the portfolio comes from a British company called Robert Cox & Co. It's of only mid-price, described as number five, so it's neither the most expensive nor the cheapest. Um, and we think the folio itself dates from some time in the 18, uh, 1860s. It's stamped on the front end gold gilt ER. This could be Bessie Elizabeth Rouse, um, and the folio could have been stamped about 10 years after it was bought, or it might also be Lizzie Rouse, who is Edwin Stevens' sister, who was born in 1845, within two years of Bessie. Um, Edwin Stephen and Lizzie grew up at Rouse Hill House and also at Gunterwang near Mudgee and were known to take music lessons at Rouse Hill House. So if the folio dates to around 1865, both of these women would have been around 20. So this is the peak age for collecting sheet music and then binding it. So why did they leave it um, in this folio? This is a folio, I guess, that typifies these notions of endogenous and exogenous collecting, so arrangement from within and then collection from without um, the particular music collection. Um, because inside the folio, there's sheet music that's variously signed by Bessie Buchanan, her maiden name, um, as well as Bessie's daughters, Nina, and there's a KB Rouse, I'm assuming that that's Kathleen Rouse at this point. Um, Two pieces of music in this folio seem to have been published in New South Wales at Woolcott and Clark's or at the various other incarnations of Woolcott and Clark's music businesses around Sydney. We've got a Catty Darling as sung by Mad Madame Anna Bishop, um, for which hundreds of copies circulated in the colonies as Bishop toured. Um, there's also a copy in the collection at Throsby Park, Mossvale. Um, and we think this particular copy might date from around 1855, uh, printed and published by J.R. Clark at 356 George Street. Please correct me if I've got that dating wrong. Um, the other one uh, that is a New South Wales publication is The Grand Gallop, The Shoe Fly, and I really want to hear this one played at some point, by Walter J. Rice. Um, and this is published by J.R. Clark when they're at 23 Hunter Street and printed by a Sydney publisher, J.A. Engel, at 103 York Street. The large bulk of this folio, however, is popular, sacred and inspirational songs for voice and piano. Not exactly hymns or anthems for liturgical use, but the type of religiously inspired song for singing around the piano at home. 
These are largely composed by John Blockley, um, as well as published by him and titled Listening Angels, Christ is Born in Bethlehem, There is a Happy Land. Um, and this one is titled With Symphonies and Accompaniments, which comes from an earlier tradition of liturgical music pre-Oxford reform and organs in churches, which we know existed in Sydney um, as St James Anglican Church were being built, they had gallery bands. They weren't particularly good, but provided symphonies and accompaniments between all the psalm verses. Um, some of these are signed Bessie Buchanan, again, so they might be hers. And most of these have retailers' blind stamps from Kramer and Beale or Kramer, Beale and Wood in London. Um, but the Christian Martyr, by contrast, has a retailer's blind stamp from Elvie and Co. at 321 George Street. Um, R84217 is, by contrast, a bound folio. Um, it has 19 songs for male voice and piano, and there's things by Balf, four by Malloy, seven by Stephen Adams, two by Chiro Penzuti, um, the popular Barcarolle from the Bridges Sires by Offenbach. And again, even though it's a bound volume, it's really in high use. It has lots of grease on the corners, and all the spine binding is broken. Of course, these topics of these songs seem to be very gendered um, from male voice. Um, there's things about sailing the high seas and piracy, working in the fields or on a whale ray, um, a love song, or in the example that Matt and Katrina are gonna perform for us in a minute, um, a love song to a city, London Bridge. Um, most of these sheet pieces of sheet music are marked down to half price or even less, often from four shillings down to two and six. So that's another thing about the Rouse collection so far, with the Rouse's buying up job lots of cheap music from Sydney, um, was it selection by bargain basement price, first of all? That seems to be quite common in the collection, really interesting. Um, so there's not many pencil markings on this. Bessie's, Bessie Buchanan's music, by contrast, has a lot of music, she, a lot of annotations. She has been careful to annotate um, fingerings and breath marks in her piano music. And we've, we've got what we think at this point might be some of her manuscript hand as well. There's one piece that is a quadrille, but there's also a mazurka brilliant on the other, other page of it. Um, so she seems to be somebody who was taking lessons and was careful to annotate, whereas Edwin Stevens' music, there's very little um, pencil marking on it at all. So Ian pointed out yesterday that perhaps he didn't have a tutor and was just the example of the gentleman farmer who enjoyed singing but was not very technical about what he was doing. Um, Caroline Rouse Thornton's book about the family says, Edwin Stephen had a good ear and enjoyed a catchy tune. He relished singing comic songs at home when there were guests or at a local concert in the local amateur capacity. The local concert was sometimes at Rouse Hill or nearby Windsor and sometimes in Golgol. Um, so we think this is possibly Edwin Stevens' bound, bound folio at the moment. Um, and we're going to hear Matt and Katrina, as Matt as Edwin Stephen and Katrina as possibly Nina or Kathleen, perform London Bridge by Malloy for us. Thank you. Mm -hmm. 